live from the City of Angels on this Christmas night. Merry Christmas to you. Thanks for being here. MMT, we are going to celebrate by opening a bunch of presents. The top 10 films of 2023, according to me, which means this is the definitive list. There is no debate that these films belong on everyone's top 10 list of 2023. Now, by saying that, I know there's going to be a bunch of you like going, what? Hey, that's not what I have. What are you doing? I can promise you this. Bo is afraid and poor things will not be seen tonight. They'll be seen next Sunday on the worst of 2023. What do you think made the list? Come in with the comments. I do have producer Nate back with us tonight. Very excited. Everybody, give him a round of applause in the comments. He'll be popping up things throughout the night. I do want to get rolling, though. Let's do it. As I mention these films, as we roll through them, the number one determining factor on whether the film made the list or not ultimately was, did the film make me feel something, some shred of humanity? Something that moved me, whatever that was, whether it be comedy, drama, an animated film, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it made me in the theater actually feel connected to what I was watching on the big screen. And every one of these films did just that. I have a whole bunch of films that almost made the list. I'm going to mention those as well. There's a whole bunch of things we got to get to. But I do want to say before we start that anyone who says that 2023 is one of the best years in film, yeah, man, you got to slow that crawl. That's got to be slowed down. You cannot be doing that because what's happening is this year was solid, had some good films. I think a few films that almost got to the great level, maybe touched great, but I don't think we had anything like last year. If you look at last year, you had Tar. You had Decision to Leave, you had After Sun, and you had Moon Age Daydream. Those four films would easily be my top four films this year if they were released in 2023. That tells you this was a weaker year, right? If my top four from last year would slide over to my top four from this year, we know that this is not as strong a year as we saw even last year. You can go back to 2019 with Parasite, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This year was not that year. That said, I do have 10 films for you and some extra bonus selections that you, I think, will appreciate. And we start with a film that really should have had so much more love than it received throughout award season. I have not seen this film anywhere listed yet it has extremely high reviews has a great cinema score which tells me that audiences love this film as much as me it is theater camp came out last july searchlight a disservice to this film because this should have been released during award season it would have had a chance to do more damage but as a summertime release we talk about it so often it's very hard to bring any kind of momentum in through and carry it all the way through award season it's almost impossible let's go back to my reaction i'll be to pull up the reaction tweets because that's when i experienced the film and i'll be able to access exactly what i felt at that time and if you ask me what did i feel because I mentioned each of these films made me feel something, right? What did I feel watching theater camp? Joy. Pure joy. A smile-inducing hoot. There's no way theater camp won't inject pure joy into your life. Best in show, faux documentary-style blast with LOL performances across the board. Ben Platt, Jimmy Totaro that steal this mirthful summertime delight, counter-programming Nirvana. It worked out for them a little bit research slide but it did not work out in the long run for awards what a shame because theater camp was one of the most fun times i had in a theater this entire year and just had a weirdness and a quirkiness to it every character felt real and grounded even though they were not right it's this faux documentary of these theater kids at a camp in New York and just the zaniness of this film is why it is in the number 10 spot. And it beat a lot of films that you'd think would make the top 10 list. But again, I really want to make sure that we are shining a light on films that deserve more recognition. Now, some of these things like Killers of the Flower Moon we're going to get to in a little bit. Some of our bigger films that obviously have to be here because they're that great or come close to that. But when I can play around here at the bottom part of the 
top 10. I want to make sure to get a film in there that I believe deserves so in its theater camps, number 10. Number nine is Asteroid City. Now, I am not the biggest Wes Anderson fan, but if you were to ask me, what is your favorite Wes Anderson film of the past decade plus? It is easily Asteroid City. I go back to my initial reaction, a whiz-bang wonder. Asteroid City, easily one of Wes Anderson's best works. An effervescent charmer that had me grinning from opening frame. Everyone here shines. Ensemble stand out with sublime production design. It should be there. You have to look at this film in production design. I don't care if you don't want to look at it in other categories, even though I believe it does absolutely deserve to be there in the best picture, at least in the running for that. But production design and that tracking shot perfection that Wes Anderson has delivered. He's so good. Technically, I love watching his film. And you look back at the reaction stream, you can see there, technical beauty. I mean, that is what this film is. Really had a fun time with this film. What did I? What I love about this film is its quirkiness. Obviously, we're talking about Wes Anderson, of course, that we're going to talk about. What did you feel? The quirkiness, but it, it connected with me this time. And usually it doesn't. It did with French Dispatch because we had three different stories here. You had the one story, I love the UFO. I love the middle of the desert. I love the world building here, which, of course, is production design. Number nine is Asteroid City. We move ahead. Thank you, Tucker. It is very underrated film. I really appreciate anyone who notices the same things about these films. Listen. That's what I think we do really well. You guys are smart. You're a very good, very, very intelligent movie audience. You know what works and what doesn't, and you can point directly to it. And that's hopefully what I bring to the table is able to notice what a film does well, because ultimately that's why these films are on the list, because they are able to accomplish what they set out to do and then do it masterfully in a lot of cases number eight for me is dream scenario and you go and i remember sitting here watching this film with nick cage as this schlubby professor who enters people's dreams and it shouldn't work right the film shouldn't work you, you go this this isn't go. it's like it should be and it's funny because ari aster is a producer here and you get the feeling this is like a bow is afraid only great Right. This film we should be talking about, not Bo is Afraid, even though Ari asked her executive producer on this thing. Look at my initial reaction to this. Imagine Bo is Afraid, only not totally sucky. Dream Scenario does surrealism to perfection with schleppy Nick Cage becoming a global sensation to ruinous effect. Christopher Borgley imbuing humanity throughout, delivering an indelible final scene, reminding me why I love film. I mean, that's a reaction. That is what we're talking about. What did I feel from this film? I felt pathos. I felt pity for this man who only wanted to love his wife. And he had everything handed to him. At the end of the day, what's it come down to? It comes down to relationships. And that's all he wanted, even though he was a global sensation. It deals a lot with cancel culture. The film is without question one of the top 10 films of the year, I could actually push it even higher. In fact, a lot of these films, even from, you know, let's say theater camp is going to be towards the back end. When we start pushing up here, honestly, I could take a dream scenario and drag it to two. I could take our next film and drag it down. I could easily even take some of these and put it in one. It speaks to what we said at the top of the stream. This is not the strongest year where I had four films rated all above these films. Right when I go back and I look at Tar, After Sun, Decision to Leave, and Moon Age Daydream, all four of those are over all of these films. So there's a lot of play here. So don't get so hung up on the numbers. The important part is we are talking about films you need to see. If you have not, you need to watch Dream Scenario. Number seven, I know a lot of you probably guessed this because it has to be here. It's by far the best animated film of 2023 no question about it it is across the spider-verse and look at my reaction for this and i called it when i saw it way back when did i see this thing when was the date on this it's been forever my god back in may what did i say the race for oscars 2024 best animated feature is o v e r 
over and I'm right. It was done then. The second I saw this film, the most visually impressive film maybe I've ever seen. This reminded me so much of Moon Age Daydream. And the reason that this film moved me that way, just like that did, is it's art. You are watching superb art in cinema when you watch this. And what did I call attention to that's going to end up being a big-time contender to win at Oscar? Daniel Pemberton's score. Boom. Who called it back in May? That's why you're here, because I identify this stuff really early. I don't ha- need a thousand other people to tell me. I see it the second it happens, and this is by far the best animated feature of the year, and I can't wait for the second part because this is deserving of a Best Picture nomination. Anyone who says Across the Spider-Verse belongs only in animation, wrong. Eh, That is a big incorrect. That film deserves to be a Best Picture nominee. Number six, a film that is now just starting to roll out. Last weekend, well, which is, you know, two days ago, It was in New York and L.A., and when it comes to your theater, I need you to go out and see All of Us Strangers. This is a film that if you ask me what did I feel watching this other than sheer beauty, it has just a very gentle soul to it and a humanity to it, and it's all about connection and something that we long for nowadays, right? We're all stuck inside of our phones, inside of our Twitters, inside of whatever we're doing online. We're not living life, and this film speaks to finding that human connection, even though it's deeper than that. It's a hallucinatory beauty. I mean, this film is profuse with meditative style and soul. Andrew Hay, the director here, elegantly captures the loneliness and our fundamental desire for human connection. Both Andrew Scott, Paul Mescal finding character and near, near stillness. They don't do much in this film. It's really just very minimal. And that's what I love. Uh, what do I tell you guys? I always love a minimal grounded film. That's what this film is. But, but, but there is a close to this film that is going to make you question everything you just watch without giving it away. That's maybe even too much to say. I'm going to tell you, you need to see it. And I love Andrew Hayes' use of music in this film. He has Pet Shop Boys. He has Erasure. He has Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And the use of the songs and pay particular attention to the way that he uses the volume and he keeps it, he rides it so perfectly into the scene. And the example of that is when they're putting the Christmas tree up with Andrew Scott and his parents and they're putting it up and they're playing always on my mind by pet shop boys. And it's right. It's low. It's low. And then boom, the way that that is dialed in from a sound level is so strong. And it is one of my favorite films of the year. Go see all of the strangers when it gets to you. We are almost, well, we are at the halfway point. Do you have a guess as to what films are on the way? We have five left, and I have a whole bunch of honorable mentions, films you probably thought made the list, but just didn't find a spot. Yes, that's not- <laughs> that's for next Sunday. All of those films are for next Sunday, SSSRR. That's definitely not going to happen tonight, any of those films, but I guarantee you we'll discuss them on the worst of 2023. Here comes number five. Again, I could have slid this film up to two or to one even. I mean, that's where we are with these films from, say, eight on. Any of them can slide around. It really doesn't matter exactly where they are. And emotion guessing holdovers, number one. Uh, Wow, Oppenheimer. You guys might be disappointed. We have to talk about that film in a few seconds. But we are going to, yeah, maybe, maybe John Wick 4. Here it comes, number five. You'd think it might be higher, but I have Killers of the Flower Moon at number five. And the reason I have the film at number five is, in a weird way, I don't want to revisit the film. I really enjoyed the first viewing of this film. But one of the measures I have for any film that I watch is, do I want to see it again? And if I do see it again, then does it hold up, right? Which, listen, my evaluations are my evaluation. I've never changed evaluation on the second view, except for Moneyball. It's the only film I ever changed. And the reason I changed it, I've told you guys, I saw Hugo, and then I went to see Moneyball. I was not in the mood. And it's funny because today, I was going to see Color Purple, and I was just beat. I missed Christmas, I had things going on, and I said, I don't, I'm not in the right 
frame of mind to go to a movie. And I think it's very important and very mindful. You need to be mindful of if it's the right time to go see a certain movie or any movie. Last night I saw Migration. I enjoyed the hell out of it. But it was the right movie at the right time. It was short. It was just perfect. So be mindful of that. But when we go back to Killers of the Flower Moon, let's go to the uh, reaction going all the way back to October at this point. With Leo DiCaprio at the pinnacle of his thespian powers, Scorsese powerfully and engrossingly delves into the ethnic eradication of the Osage nation in Greed's name. What did I feel watching this film? Disgust, right? The disgust of the greed and doing anything and everything to get rich. That is disturbing, disgusting, and this film delivers that. And for me, the Robbie Robertson score is one of the best of the year. Listen, it's Ludwig or it's Robbie or it is Daniel for Across the Spider-Verse. Those are your three best scores. And if I had to pick one, I would probably go with Ludwig followed by Daniel, and then I'd go with Robbie Robertson because – only because that the Robertson score doesn't have the diversity that the other two do. So if you ask me which is the hardest score to produce, I would say Oppenheimer and Across the Spider-Verse. But, but the Robertson score here is the MVP of the film. I mean, you just you hear that thumping in the bass and you're like, this is it. This is the film. One of Scorsese's best films. I mean, we listen, we could rattle off 20. <laughs> name any Scorsese film, they're all pretty good, right? So to say it's one of his best, it really is one of his 15 best, right? Because they're all great, um, with a few exceptions. But in this case, Killers of the Flower Moons ends up at number five because I only saw it the one in like a quarter time. I watched like the beginning. I didn't watch the rest. All right, here we go. Number four is a film I've seen twice, a film that I was so happy that it lived up to my expectations because I knew the story more so than I typically know any story when I go to see the movie. I don't like to know a whole lot about a movie, nor, uh, I'll be honest with you guys, do I read tons of books? No, I don't. I watch tons of movies. So when it comes to an adaptation of a novel, such as Killers of the Flower Moon, I'm not familiar with the source material. I knew an idea of what it was, but I didn't know the ins and outs like I did film number four and yet sean durkin gave me the best possible version of the von eric tragedy that i could have ever hoped for that is why the iron claw is number four and i go to my reaction from just a few weeks ago had a chance to see this early got out in front of it so you got to see this film this is one of the best of the year and it reminded me so much of fox catcher you know i've said it so many times on the stream in the reaction video if you were to talk to sean durkin and ask him what were your influences for the iron claw the number one would be Fox catcher. He clearly was mirroring what he saw with, uh, what's his name? Who directed, uh, the film. Oh my God. I literally Bennett Miller. I mean, you look at Fox catcher, it's got that slow meditative, dark drama, the exact same thing you see here. Obviously they're both wrestling one amateur, one pro, but when you look at the iron claw to be able to tell this story, the way that he does and keep all the characters really strong and clear focus, the precision of what Durkin does here, and then the ensemble work. For me, it's Zach Efron. Without question, Efron has to carry the film as Kevin Von Erich, the lone survivor, and Harris Dickinson, who kicks total ass and then unfortunately does not make it very far into the film. But he's great. I didn't leave, I didn't mention White at all because I don't think he is the strongest member, but the character's not as strong. Kerry Von Eric. And again, the problem I had with that is because he doesn't physically ma- measure up. That said, The Iron Claw is by far one of the best films of the year. It needs to be on top 10 list. It should be up for best picture. Really, again, what are we doing at this point when we have things like Poor Things and we have May, December, in contention. Poor Things is going to get in. May, December's in contention. And you're not talking about the Iron Claw? What are we doing? May, December? That laughable shit show of a film? 
I didn't think I'd get it. Here it comes. That Lifetime movie, but it's Todd Haynes. It's still a Hallmark Channel piece of shit film. Terrible. May, December's terrible. Iron Claw kicks, puts it in a figure four leg lock, and then the other Von Erich brother jumps off and suplexes off the top rope. And May, December is broken leg and probably more than likely paralyzed by the Von Erichs. That got dark. <laughs> oh, my God. Please do not show me May, December on the poor things is in. I can't even rail against that anymore. It's embarrassing. Here we go. Top three. Give me your choices right now. What do you think we have? What do we have in the top three spots? You guys should know this. You've seen all, everything so far. <laughs> Why? Well, I just did Iron Claw. Well, <laughs> Gone Girl's so close. You're so close. Number three is John Wick 4. I couldn't leave this thing off the list, and I also couldn't put it at the 10 spot. I have to put John Wick 4 all the way up here at the number three spot. Again, could be number one for all I care because all these films are rated about the same at the top. You look at this. It is one of the greatest action movies ever made. No question about it, right? It tops all three of its predecessors in storytelling, scope, and stakes, and those astonishing set pieces. They just come one after the other after the other. I mean, it's hard to fathom all this is in one film. Skarsgård, I loved him. Loved him this film. Hellaciously thrilling fran franchise finish. And is that the fit problem? Definitely not. You know, we're going to get, I mean, this movie killed it. Box office. One of the best films of the year. John Wick 4 has to be there. What did I feel watching this film? I felt testosterone surging through my body because I'm watching John Wick 4, one of the greatest action movies ever made. Give me a thumbs up. I know you agree. We have our final two. I'm going to do number two. Then I'm going to roll through my honorable mentions because there's a bunch of those. And then I'm going to deliver the number one film of the year. And then I can take as many comments as you want to do and any kind of uh, you know feedback you have on the list. Certainly anything that you think warrants a spot that maybe I forgot. I mean, that's it was so early in the year, right? What was the what was the date of March 6th? My God, it's almost a year ago that I saw this film. But that's the key. You've got to remember the films that rock your I'm just literally rock your world, right? Like John Wick 4. You cannot leave that off the list. That you cannot leave John Wick 4. And it's not, it's it should be up for best picture. Why not? Why do we live in a world where that can it's a hell of a lot better than poor things? May December. Way better than those films. Better than Barbie for me, too. You see Barbie on this list? No, I didn't hate Barbie, but it's not on the list. Come on, man. All right, number two, I saw someone just come in and, and nailed it. Um, this is a film that you're going to get a chance to see here over the next few weeks. N listen, you talk about what you feel when you watch a film. When I watched this film, I felt horror, right? Not like the traditional horror film that we you sit through, the, the typical stuff that we watch that I love. I mean, it's one of my favorite genres now, horror. There's so much great stuff happening in that space. This is talking about the horror of watching the reality of what occurred and then the absolute the thing about the zone of interest when you watch this film because not many of you have seen this film they pull up my reaction when you watch zone of interest i think the thing that you are left literally jaw drop on the floor is the fact that what you're watching occurred and people were doing just this living normal lives next door to the horrors of the concentration camp. And it's it's got this eerie sterility to it. And a lot of that has to do with Micah Levi. When I mention score, it's one of the most important elements of any film. That is why I always point that out. I'm always dialed into that. You saw in the tweet, I mentioned Pemberton. I mentioned Robertson. Here I mention Micah Levi. That it's sparing. It's not a lot, but when it's on, you will know. And what she does, they do with that score elevates this 
film, and that's why score is so essential. It captures the horrors of the Holocaust in artistically riveting manner, keeping enough of Under the Skin's weirdness. It's a weird film, just like Glazer's Under the Skin. Obviously not at all the same, but he's just an interesting director. He's going to make things that go, wait a second, what? And it's an indelible experience. I, I'll never forget this film because of the horror you're watching and the distance you have from it. And then your mind is left going. And then, of course, at the end, there is something that he pulls. Glazer does that is just like, boom, here. So now you're here and now I'm going to literally, there's the knockout. And you're like, I can't. I can't even. And that's the zone of interest. You need to see the film. By far one of the best films of the year. It's number two for me. Okay. We'll take guesses on number one. I think you guys know what number one is. I mean, come on. It's it's kind of silly, but we can we can pretend that we don't know. But I do want to mention the films that did not make the list because these are the honorable mention films, and there's a whole bunch of them. And let me speak to why I left some off, and it was really, it's hard, man. A lot of these films are graded almost the same. So consider these still films you should watch. Obviously, Oppenheimer. Now, you guys know, go back to the reaction stream. The problem I have with Oppenheimer is I love the direction of Christopher Nolan. If you're asking me what was one of my favorite directed film from a pure direction, not a screenplay, direction, of course I'm going to say Oppenheimer. The problem is the screenplay didn't make me feel, right? Oppenheimer doesn't make you feel. It makes you feel awe from the technical prowess of Nolan and the performances of everyone involved, but it doesn't make you feel like you'd hope to feel. Ludwig Gorenson scores my number one of the year. I mean, it's it's got to be it's it's in the top three with the three I mentioned, but I would say it's number one. You go back in ten, it's same thing. I mean, Ludwig Gorenson, Michael Levi. If you can get these two to score your film, you're gold, right? It's done. Your 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 film's going to be in Resner Ross. Duh. You get one of them to score your film, your your money. Also, didn't I didn't put it on the honorable mention list, but I did really enjoy Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was very fun. Very fun film. And I saw someone mention in the comments, and I agree with that. It's it's a good film. A film that really could have been here and, and frankly could have been in the 10th spot with Theater Camp with any of these films would have been Blackberry. One of the best screenplays of the year. Glenn Howerton is fantastic. He deserves a supporting nomination for this film. It is... Uh, you know, from a pure screenplay perspective, here's what here's this is what's interesting about Oppenheimer and Blackberry back to back. Oppenheimer has the direction I'm looking for, and Blackberry has the screenplay I'm looking for. The problem with Blackberry is it doesn't have the direction. It doesn't have the flair. Just even even a minimal flair. You look at a even an iron claw is not some kind of, you know, showy directorial piece. But the direction, shot on film, there's little things. BlackBerry just looks cheap, okay? And it's unfortunate because everyone is, is is amazing, and also the screenplay is one of the best. But I don't love the film. I talk to my friend Paul about this all the time, and he goes, he tries to defend. He goes, yeah, but you're, it doesn't look that good. It just looks like a really low-budget indie film. And that's fine. It's what it is. But it, it's, it's very good. It's one of my favorite films of the year, along with Shortcomings. They're talking about a film no one discusses. Has anyone discussed shortcomings? Randall Park's directorial debut. This is a film that discusses, and I think something that you know, even I could probably be mindful of. Sometimes your personality rubs off on other people, and it's not the best thing. And when you watch this film, you've got this filmmaker, wannabe filmmaker, and he's just super depressed. And it's about his life and interactions with Sherry Cola, who's so good in this. And she's also great in Joyride. She should deserve a supporting nomination for those two films. Like, you could combine them. But no one talks about shortcomings. Watch it. It's it's really, especially for people that love film, you'll, you'll really enjoy what Randall Park does with that screenplay. I like shortcomings a lot. It didn't quite make the list, but it's right there. Another film that easily could be on the list, Anatomy of a Fall. Uh, I think the the beauty of this film lies in, obviously, the performance of Huller and her son, but also 
just the nebulous nature of it. You don't know if she did it or not. And you don't, you don't know. You'll never know. They don't tell you. And there's something to that. Leave things open-ended. You don't need to tell the audience exactly how everything happens. Let them figure it out or maybe leave it open so that at the end, you can go have a discussion. Did she or didn't she? I don't know. Let's discuss this. Do you think so? If you ask me, did she kill her husband? I would tell you yes. And there's a million reasons why. The other thing I want to mention about this film no one's talking about is the prosecutor. In this film, that actor, I don't have him in front of me right now, so great. That's another performance no one's talking about. He's fantastic. Anatomy of Fall, another great film. Air should be on uh, anyone's list as well. It's right there for me. Had a blast watching this film. Throwback to the 80s in Affleck's direction. I think Jason Bateman is somebody that no one's talking about. The story that he tells, remember when he's sitting there with, he, he's sitting there and he, he's having a discussion talking about the importance of the shoes. He talks about his daughter. He's divorced. He talks about the shoes and how he bonds with his daughter. That is a moment. That is a moment Jason Bateman lays out. I love Jason Bateman. I would want to, I want to write a movie for Jason. We need to have Jason Bateman in every other movie. He really should be. He needs to be in more movies. He is one of the best parts of air. And it is one of the best films of the year, along with Priscilla. No one's talking about this film either. Uh, Jacob Elordi is fantastic in this and Saltburn. I mentioned that in a tweet today. I said, listen, Jacob Elordi's better in Saltburn and couple with Priscilla than Charles Melton in May, December. It's not even a contest. Elordi's a superstar. Elordi, I hadn't seen him until I saw Priscilla and then I saw Saltburn. You watch this kid and you go, this is the guy. This is the man. This is the big dick swinger. This guy. You can't even miss it. It's right there. And I'd never seen him before that. And I just go, that's it. Be, give me some Alordi stock. Hey, well, how much is it going for? I know it's going for a lot already. 75, I'll take it. It's going up to 700. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, the kid's a stud. But also Spainy here. And it's, it's, you know, it's the antithesis of what Baz did with Elvis. That's why the two of them couple well. But the film and the use of music, again, with Coppola and what she does with the music in the film, without using Elvis songs, using the music, that is a really strong film, and it's very quiet and understated. And that's the kind of film I like, too. I love films like that, Anatomy of Fall, quiet, grounded. These are the films I love, along with an Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, another film that could easily be on the list, Abby Fortson. What a revelation she was in that film. And Kathy Bates as Grandma. She should be getting attention for supporting actress. She is the scene stealer in that film. But that film has so much heart, captures just the weirdness of being a middle school kid going off to you know meet new friends at a new school and the trouble and the all the all that that goes through your mind it does a great job of that it's a judy bloom book in case you didn't know uh one of the best films of the year as well um so those are all my films that popped into my mind today when i was coming up with the list there's probably something i'm forgetting like you know how to blow up a pipeline cool little film neon film there's a lot of things that i liked this year no film that i absolutely adore as much as a tar an after sun decision to leave or moon age daydream that's it that's it we have arrived at number one i think you guys all know what it is you all know what number one is i've seen it twice now and i think the one thing that we need to discuss about this film that no one's talking about and this is really a shame because I pointed this out from the second I saw this way back in September. When I saw this film, I said to myself, this needs to be a director note you have to put. You don't have a choice. You've got to put pain in director. Why? Because he makes a film that feels like it was made in 1971. He puts all I, I was sitting here watching this thing way back in September, listening to the audio at the Rodeo screening room, one of the best audio houses in all of L.A. All of the sound is coming from the front. That is 1970. These are the things you've got to pay attention to. This is important. These are little touches that makes it feel authentic. And that is the that says right here, the exquisite period touches that he, that he puts on this film. Payne puts in it, and of course, we're talking about the performances. You've got Giamatti, you've got Randolph, and you've got Sessa. The three of them working as a team 
and this is the best Giamatti's ever been. If anyone deserves best actor, it is Paul Giamatti, and this is how I feel about Giamatti. It's the same way I felt about Kate Blanchett. What was the best performance of last year, period, whether it was actor or actress? No, we do not do the non-gender bullshit. Actor or actress, it was Kate Blanchett in Tar, and guess what? Giamatti is the best actor or actress of 2023 you give him best actor although we know what happened last year they didn't give it to Kate Blanchett and that is why the academy is a joke because they keep getting it wrong because they're going for what feels right instead of going for what is right and we are never going to go for what feels right we're going to go for what is right and what's merit and guess what everybody the number one film of 2023 is the holdovers all right, it's open comment time. Hit me with whatever you want. Producer Nate, I'm ready. Bring the heat. Give me anything you got. I'll take Super Chats, anything here on this Christmas. I figured we didn't want to do the worst of the year on Christmas. That'd be weird. I figured we'd do the best of the year because it's like opening presents. on the. We'll do it New Year's Eve because God knows I'm not going anywhere on New Year's Eve. Next Sunday, we will count down the worst films of 2023. Gone Girl, Killian Murphy and Oppenheimer, best performance. I disagree. It's Giamatti. I, I'm not suggesting that Murphy is not great. I'm just telling you for me, Giamatti, and they're in the same category. So there you go. But But I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Like, it's not like you're throwing like Emma Stone and poor things. She's the best part of the film, but I can't even think about that film. It's like, nope, we can't do it. We're not going to do it. Although we will think about it for worst film of the year, for sure. I mean, it's going to be a very serious contention with Bo is Afraid. Man, what will be the number worst film of the year? Those two films are really tough. Sotvik, No Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning. It was one of the films I can, you know what? Sotvik, it's funny. I, I had it there in the honorable mentions. Just consider it there with the honorable mentions. It's, it's a very entertaining film. I had a blast watching it, so I would put it there too. That's the thing is I have so many films kind of rated about the same, like eight and a half, nine, nine and a half. I don't have any tens. I only have like nine and a half and down, and that would be there. It's it's a good film. It's a really good film. Best comedy. Uh, best comedy of the year would be Theater Camp. It's a comedy. Theater Camp by far best comedy of the year. Um, other film. You know what? I just saw Migration. I laughed my ass off. That film is is smart. It's weird, and it's so much better than anything Disney's putting out. Raw Elimin Illumination is just killing Disney right now. Just smashing them. Illumination is going to take over. They have already taken over. Illumination films are bigger. You know, before the film, they actually have a short with the uh, minions. I mean, the minions are bigger than anything Disney has right now, aren't they? Uh, best sports film. Ooh, that'd be the Iron Claw. Yeah, right? So there's your sports film. Uh, be, if you're asking for beyond that, I mean, comedy, I'm going to have to think on that because I've got to go through my list again. But the film that made me laugh the most was Theater Camp. And then followed by, you know, best sports film was definitely Von Erickson in Iron Claw. Um, uh, Guardian of the Galaxy 3, listen, I think Guardians 1 is by far the best of those three films. And then I have 2 and 3 ranked about the same. I liked elements of Guardians 3. The problem is, is the repetition. Go back and watch the stream. If you didn't, Greens 4, welcome to the uh, channel, by the way. Um, if you haven't watched any of the old videos and you're wondering what did I think about a movie, go back and watch one of the streams. There's a ton of reaction streams. I try to put, you know, either reaction video or the whole stream. You can find almost any movie over the past since we've been doing this thing for almost two years now. So you can find it. Um, but Guardians of the Galaxy 3, too much repetition, too many needle drops, same thing over and over. You know, I just wish that film were tighter. It would be a better film. I still think there's no way to beat number one greens no way number one is by far the best guardians film it's not even a contest yes thank you life of bride this was a decision uh, by me to go ahead and go with the christmas call this is like i wore i think this is last christmases as well because it just works perfectly right for those of you wondering it is atletico san luis from liga emeki and so yeah it just it's a perfect uh, it's got the red it's got the green it's christmassy but uh, yeah, thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. And, you know, almost coming up on two years on the channel. It's been fun. Honestly, it really has. Producer Nate, hit me with the comments, whatever you got. I guess nine or 10. You did a good job. You really did. I, I did. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, no, no. You know why? Because Dream Scenario made me feel the characters more than Oppenheimer. That's why. Oppenheimer, no one is going to ever tell you that Oppenheimer is not. I told you direction, just the direction. And most of the performances, 
I'm going to take that film, but the problem is the screenplay. That's not, it doesn't, and it also, the prop, Nolan has a problem imbuing emotion into his films. We can all agree on that, right? Why, that's why I tell you Interstellar is his best film, because it's the one time you can really feel the emotion. You really feel it in that film. The connection of dad and daughter, right? Over the years and the aging, oh my God, that film just blows me away. I love Interstellar, his number one film. This film doesn't do that. There's nothing. There's no move. Did you ever think about crying in Oppenheimer? Ever? When? No, of course you didn't. Did you even feel anything? No, you felt the filmmaking, but you didn't feel the film. You feel the film on the explosion, but again, that's not the emotion. That's the visceral. That is the all of that's coming in, but none of the emotion. The film's just lacking emotion. Best actor physique of the year. It'd be Ryan Gosling and Barbie, wouldn't it? Well, actually, oh man, Zach Efron. Efron is almost too big. He's too ripped. Like Efron's jacked, and he's oh, he's he's almost like when he's in the movie, he's like he's like this, right? He's like that guy. He and and I don't know. I I just tone him back a little bit. I mean, listen, I've I've seen I've never seen Zach in person. I saw Gosling in person, and let me tell you, Gosling's a good looking dude, and physically he's like six one. He's put together. Like I can see why the ladies go all right and go. Oh my god. I get it. I mean, I totally understand that. But yeah, it would be close. I would probably go with Gosling though. Gosling's got a he's got a great physique. And he's been working hard. He definitely works out like a lot. Look at the fall guy. He's he's even bigger. He's been he really puts it to it. I, I appreciate anybody who does that. Martin, welcome back to the channel. Can you explain poor things? <laughs> oh no. Don't ask me. Don't ask me to even listen. Go back and watch the stream. I can't. That's gonna be the worst next week. Go back and watch the poor thing stream where I look like I just had was run over by a car. That film I hate with every fiber of my being, and I don't want to do that on Christmas. So don't ask me. About, <laughs> we'll talk about it next week. On New Year's Eve, here's what we're going to do. Next week, I prom I don't ever do this. On New Year's Eve, I'm going to drink some of this. I'll finish. Maybe not finish because I don't. I told you guys I don't, I'm not gore. I don't drink every day. <laughs> I'm going to drink some of this, and we're going to do the worst of the year. That'll be kind of rowdy. I like that'll be fun. Best actress might go to Rob. I think it's like Gladstone, no question, Jose. Uh, Gladstone wins. It's not even a contest, actually. She wins. Because it's it's a combination of I think she does a great job in the film, but also it's about what feels good, and that's what Hollywood does now. It's like Gladstone. It definitely is. Uh, Margot Robbie uh, will not win. She doesn't deserve to win. It's, it's, a, it's a solid performance, but... Uh, you know, I think it's a performance that gets better as the film goes on. When I first started, I go, I don't know about this with with uh, Mar Margo. And then as the film goes on, you're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, she's there, like at the end. But, but yeah, right? Emma Stone, fine, fine. You can have her for poor things, but you can have nothing else from that film. Not a single other thing. Not anything. Certainly not screenplay. If poor things win screenplay, guys... I might give it all up. I might quit because I can't. We're not going to do this anymore. Best song. Best song, original song. You know what's interesting is I haven't even updated that on awards days because I'm so disinterested in so many of these films. <laughs> I kind of, this year was not, I'm just, you know, I'm just not that excited about these films, especially when you got films that aren't even going to make the list. Like Iron Claws, I'm going to get into Best Picture, right? Half the films you just heard of here, they're not going to get into Best Picture, right? Holdovers, well, of course. John Wick Four is not um, best song. I I got to think about that. Uh, I don't even think I have one that pops into my mind. Usually, there's a, like there's a song from a film. The the Barbie songs are fine. Uh, was there a song like at the end of a film that like carried it in? Like last year it was "Hold My Hand" from Maverick. For me this year, I don't think there is, even is one. Is there, Jose? Tell me one. I don't even know. What's your favorite? Uh, cinematography. Great question. Um, I mean, you look at Zone of Interest, but I think I love the – it's a very static shot, right? The, the whole thing is a static shot, static shot, static shot. There's not any camera movement or anything, so I, I like it from a visual standpoint, but it's I wouldn't put it as best cinematography of Zone of Interest, even though I know it'll probably get in. I would – I mean, you got to go Oppenheimer. you got to look there. Uh, you've got to look at, let me go back and look at my list here of, of films here for a second. Of the films that I had in my top 10 that I would have for cinematography, you know, not a lot of these, actually. I mean, John Wick 4, solid. Iron Claws, okay. Killers of Flower Moon, certainly, you know, it's it's good. All of the Strangers, strong. 
Um, nothing blew me away from a cinematographer. I, I would put Asteroid City in, to be honest with you, because I think it's really, I love his tracking shots. But when you look at the films that I saw this year, there was nothing that blew me away. Even Tar's uh, cinematography is better, I think, than a lot of the stuff that I saw this year. And I'm a cinematography and score guy. So this year, other than Oppenheimer, um, not a lot pops off like like I expect. Um, yeah, 49ers got killed. I saw that. It, it, and listen, I'm a guy. I, Brock Purdy, I loved coming out of Iowa State. I watched him play at Iowa State. This guy's got moxie. You say, what does he have? He has moxie, but he also has four interceptions in him. Not a good game for him. Definitely not winning MVP. I'm sorry for that. I'm so sorry. But you do have Christian McCaffrey. He's uh, he's a pretty big stud. A 500 bucks zone of interest. I, I listen. I'm telling you now, movie lover. Uh, welcome to the channel, by the way. Uh, I had it in picture the whole time. I want uh, please everybody give me a like, come in and tell me. I had zone of interest in picture the entire time. I had it from the second I saw it. Go back, go back and look at the reaction. And I, and I just because I, you know, listen. My job is to if I get something right, if I get it wrong, it's rare. I will say it. What do I say right here? Go back and look at my reaction to zone of interest. What do I say? What is it? destined to be major Oscars twenty twenty four contend contention for for major for contention. I nailed it. And that was way back. When did I see this film? October? October 4th. So, uh, yeah, I mean, no question. Sound should be there because of the use of sound. Michael Levi's score. And I, I, I think it's fair for picture as well because of, because of certainly the topic as well. Any film that is even tangentially connected to the Holocaust is going to do well at the Oscars. It's just the reality of it. But this is very deserving, and it's a different look at it. And a horrifying look at it because of its frigidness, right? You're just you're just like this family just doesn't. They're literally involved in the biggest massacre in, in human history, and they're just having normal life next door. That's the that's the horror of that film. Uh, thanks for being here, movie lover. By the way, appreciate you watching the channel. Uh, Producer Nate, what else we got? Let's let's hit some more comments here. We'll do rapid fire as many as I can. Any super chats, bring them in. I'll take them here. And we'll go about another 15, one hour tonight for the best of. Next Sunday will be our next stream, and we will do the worst of the year. And you can only imagine what films are going to be in the worst of the year. I mean, the worst of the year are going to be some really bad films, such as seeing the Iron Claw. You, you're going to love it. It's a very good film. I've seen it twice. It's great. But you look at Poor Things. You look at Bo is Afraid. And there's plenty of other films. Those two, Those two films. Dream Scenario was awesome. I'm so glad you guys. I'm so glad you guys all watched that film and you liked it. A lot of you did. It's very good, and he should be up for best actor as well. I totally agree with you. He's he's downplay right. He's he's subdued Nick Cage. Subdued Nick Cage is great. We saw it in Pig. We see it here. We've seen it not often, right? Those two for sure. And when he is like that, and here schlubby. It's perfect, and he's very good. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mega Swiper. I read all your comments before I got on. By the way, you're talking about the Apple, the the Vision thing. I don't want any part of that. I want to live a real life. I do not want something strapped to my face. Okay, I have no interest. Pause on Asteroid City. Better than the French Dispatch. Good. You know, uh, Asteroid City is a film that I think a lot of people. I, I don't know why didn't connect with. I had a lot of fun with it, and uh, it's it's just a great setting and so often a film can work simply on setting can it it can work on the world building the production design okay all of that if you, you have that oppenheimer strong production design any period piece better have strong production design any sci-fi fantasy better have strong production design you have to have that world that feels tangible especially if it is a throwback if you have even air it felt like it was in the 80s. You have to do those things. It's got to nail those things. Uh, and Margot Robbie's best performance, Asteroid City, I would probably agree with that too. Uh, I, I think it's okay. She's okay in Barbie. I just would never have her in best. I would never have her, which is weird because we're talking about best Best picture is going to go to Barbie. I've said that over and over. I called it like six months ago. Best picture, Barbie wins. And I've said it six months ago. At this point, it's, it's like ridiculous. I'm saying it Christmas night. It'll win. But we're not talking about Margot Robbie winning best actress. She's Barbie because it's more about the achievement of Greta Gerwig. That's why Gerwig has a better chance in director than Margot Robbie in actress, right? We're, we're talking about, remember, whenever we're doing these evaluations, we're talking about, and back to the movie lover and, and noticing what's very important here, sound and score with zone of interest. You have to be able to identify what the film does well. 
And then what are those elements? And then how can we uh, make sure we acknowledge those? And when you look at Barbie, it's a direction play. It's a screenplay. It's not necessarily a performance, out, although Gosling, yes, but not Margot Robbie. I know that's weird. I get it. But you guys understand what I'm saying. So, you know. I think, oh, no, you guys are, thank you. You know, exactly. I'm so glad you connect with Dream Scenario. I, I wish more people were talking about this film. You know, the thing about Dream Scenario is it, it really points to, I think, all of us want some level of fame. I mean, we just do, right? And I'm not saying that's what I wake up, I trust me, I, I don't. But my point is, is we all have this kind of vision of what it would be like if we were, and then the reality of what he experiences is kind of the reality of what it is. And, and his whole life thrown upside down, and then he loses everything when he thought he had everything by gaining the fame. And it turns out without it, he was happier. And I think that's the reality of it. You know, if you talk to a lot of stars out there who deal with so much shit in their lives and have to constantly be on that hamster wheel, getting the next role, doing all those things. I told you the story of that character actor that I ran into at an awards party. He's the guy who was in Collateral, the police chief. I, I don't know his name. He's got the gray hair. He's got the mustache beard. He's the dude in Collateral who they're, they're you know, getting the teams together. He, I talked to him and he said, acting is not acting. Acting is when you're on the set thinking, what's my next job? That's not a life. Do you don't want, I don't want to live like that. Do you? Oh man, am I going to get another job? Like, how am I going to pay my bills? If I don't get a job after this movie, that would suck. And that's their thing. They have to constantly think about what's next, what's next, what's next. So I, I think fame is, is totally overrated. Um, you know, the money is okay. I would take some money, but you know, it is what it is. It, it, it can't be the driving force. You know, ultimately when we started this channel, it was never about subscribers or views. It was about talking about films and, and, and being authentic and talk about things that I love and things that I hate. And that's all it is. It's never about, it's never about trying to get more views, more clicks, more this. I've never said an opinion about a movie to get more views. I've never said poor things is terrible because I wanted the people to associate me with, I hate poor things. It's a terrible film. I, 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 if I ever see your ghost out and about, there's a good chance I'm going to walk up to him and clothesline him. But, <laughs> oh, whoever's going to cancel, he's going to Von Eric, your ghost. But, He's, he's going to throw the discus punch like Kerry Von Eric to Yorgos Lanthimos. Someone captured it on video. Rears back and goes, that's for poor things. Uh, but the, these are all real. There's no, there's no false, you know, put on bullshit with me. I don't have time for that. My, of course, we all have time for it. But I don't, I don't, that's not how I operate. You guys know that. You guys watch the channel. That's just the reality of it. I, and I'm the only guy who will actually get in front of these things. These movies suck. Everyone else is like, no, poor things is great. And then behind the scenes, they get as soon as the thing, poor things was fucking terrible. Do you see that movie? My God, that Weber guy, he's a badass. But I can't say that in public. I'm gonna get crucified. I can't do that. Yes, you can. Just say it. Why are you so afraid? People are so afraid of saying something. Just get out there and say it. Spider Verse is way up there for me. I mean, like I said, you know, you know, Gone Girl. You got all kinds of movies you can move around here. You talk about experiences, anything that I see and I go, whoa, as soon as the movie's over, you're like, oh, my God, I got to rush to get this reaction out. Dream scenario, I felt that way. Spider-Verse, obviously, holdovers, so many of these, all these films. Whenever you feel that way about a film, you're excited. Anything that you're not, you can tell. I'm like, I don't like some of the films I, I look go back and I look, I didn't even say anything about this film because I didn't have a real reaction to it. Not good or bad. And that's a lot of the Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, my God. Like those kind of films, like just why, why it's not good. I just want to watch, you know, ultimately I think, don't we all just want to watch a good story, a, a well-told story. And ultimately when we review these things and we evaluate them, you are looking for what are they trying to do and do they do it well? So a horror film, does it scare you? Does it horrify you? Does it move you, you know, in some way? Ultimately that's what you want from any film, but you look at the genre, what it's trying to do, the film. And then you say, was successful? Go back to last night, watching Migration. Migration, w what's it designed to do? Animated, family, fun, kids flick. But with jokes that are smart and funny and on point. It has all those things. And it moves quick. It's like 87 minutes long. And it's fun. And it's got a nuclear family. And there isn't, 
I guys get ready. Are you ready for this? It's Illumination, not Disney. I know here come the cancel people, but I'm just letting you know Illumination did not put a trans duck in migration. I know it's shocking. There is no trans duck. There is no anything else. They're normal ducks. And not that you're not normal, but you know what I mean? Like when the agenda, and I called it last night, agendized. These films are agendized. They have been, things have been inserted into them because they're, oh, we got it. But no, you don't have to put it in. If it's in, it's in. If it's part of the story, if it's organic, you put it in. You don't just put it in. That's what we do now with all these things. You go, well, we kind of need to. No, you don't need to have it. Just it, it, if it is, it is, it isn't. I don't care, Right. I mean, that's why you have to at least, it, listen, Nolan. When I mean, Nolan made Oppenheimer, like, oh, it's a bunch of white people. Well, the reality is, does the history say that everybody in Oppenheimer is white? I mean, I don't know, right? That's the thing, right? Are we going to mess with the reality of the situation and the truth of it so that we can assuage people to do? I don't, you know, I, I don't know why I don't like it. I just, I, because it takes you out of the movie, right? You can feel it. You feel that you feel the manipulation. I don't want to feel that. I just want to feel it be natural. Just have it be natural or just don't do it. Whatever that is. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's weird. You know, it's weird is a lot of times these reactions just come organically. Like last night I was just watching the movie. And it's just like, this is how I feel. You, you don't try to manufacture it because if you try to manufacture it, then it wasn't real. And I think that's what do we just talk about when you're making a film and you're trying to manufacture these things and insert these things and these messages and these agendas, then that's what takes you out. I'm not the anti woke guy, but I can tell you this when a film does that, it takes me out of the film and that's a disservice to the film. Don't do these things. Just pick the best people, make the best movies. And that's the end of the story. You don't need to have Everyone be happy at the end of the day and plead. We got to get one of, no, we don't just get, make the movie. I, I, I God, if I ever get, got took over a studio, they'd be like, my God, this guy, nope, just make, I don't care. We don't have an, I don't care. Do you, you're making the movie, go make it. I'm not, I'll deal with the people. Then when the, the heat comes afterwards, you didn't have an upper, I would say, listen, man, why don't you find a new hobby? They're like, holy shit. Weber just told the reporter to find a new hobby. I go, do you really stay up at night thinking about these things? Because if you do, we need to find you something a little more, you know, that you can do with your life than ask these questions that are completely pointless. <laughs> oh, my God. I, you know what? You know, it's funny. I do want to say something about Oppenheimer. I didn't have it on the top 10, although it's there, man. It's like number 11. Come on, guys. Give me a break. I did see Oppenheimer. You guys ready for this? I saw Oppenheimer three times. Okay, I want to be. Okay, can, can I be fully honest with you guys? Can I? I didn't watch all of Oppenheimer three times. <laughs> Listen, just I didn't lie. Can I explain something? I went in and watched the beginning again, and I watched the ending again. So I've seen Oppenheimer really two times. But the point was, I saw an IMAX, IMAX 70 millimeter, and then 70 millimeter. So those are the three big ones, right? Those, I've seen it all three formats, but I haven't seen it three times. <laughs> I can't lie, man. It's so hard. It's, it's hard for me to lie. You guys can tell, right? You guys can tell, like, when I try to lie, it's like, ooh, that didn't come out well. That's not good. I saw Jason Bateman in there. Thank you, Jason. Someone actually noticed Jason Bateman. Why am I the only people that see these things? Uh, Jose, yes, I saw American Fiction. Didn't make the list. Um, go back and watch the stream. I think we nailed that film. It's a film that has too many characters. I wish it just would. I, the blackening's fun. Ghost with the most. I like the blackening. I had a lot of fun with that film. Good call. Really cool film. Expendable's horrible. God, that'll be on next week. Howardson's amazing. I'm missing some of these comments from like 30 minutes ago. Sorry, I'm going to go through these real quick. Producer Nate like rolled out. He's like, I'm going to bed. Uh, Bateman's a great actor. He's so good, isn't he? Even if he's the same guy in everything. And Lordy is tell Tom Cruise. I totally agree. I'm going to get as many comments as possible. We need a collateral prequel. I totally agree with that. 100%. Big Dick Swinger is Barry Keegan. Yeah, I guess that's true now. Um... <laughs> Uh, the holdovers is hitting Australia. Eleventh uh, of oh, you're gonna love it. You can't. You're gonna love it. Film talking. 
yeah, How to Blow Up a Pipeline is fantastic. It's a very good film. I liked, I love the filmmaking on that. It's, it's real raw, and the score is badass. One of the best scores of the year. Finney Bull is terrible. That's another one I'll be up for next week for sure. Um, Joy Divine Rudolph is a, amazing in that film. Or Divine Joy. Which, is it Joy Divine? Or Rudolph? She's very good. She's great. She should win. I think she wins, no question. Best supporting lineup is uh, Gosling, De Niro, Sessa, Howerton, and Lordy. I like that. It's really good. As you're smart. You're a good. You're a good person. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever the sex is, who cares? There are no sexes. Best actress lineup. Uh, for me, that would be without question Gladstone. I think I got to go through. Let me look at my list. You, you know, I told you this year's not been great. No, I'm not really thrilled with this year. As far as there's no films that I uh, listen, I just talked about a bunch of films I really like. But I'm telling you, all my films from last year I had top four would be in would be here. Okay, I like Gladstone. I have not seen Maestro. I probably will because I already broke you know my embargo with with Netflix by watching May December and then that oh Rebel Moon. I know Make a Swiper is gonna be pissed when I say this. My God, that movie. Did you guys watch a Rebel Moon? Oh my God, so. Um, see, I, I, Greta Lee. Did you? By the way, is Past Lives nowhere near my list? Not, no way, no way. From a filmmaking perspective, that's it. Never got around to Origin. I didn't get around to some of these things. I didn't get around to some of these films because I wasn't that excited to see a lot of these films. I, best actors is bad this year. Good God, why? For I'm sorry, I can't even give you an answer for that. I'll take Gladstone and then Holler for sure from Anatomy of a Fall. And then every other film, I don't think we had a, well, watch out. Weber didn't have a female. It didn't have a, a lead. A fem- I didn't. I really didn't. Holler. Oh, my God. All these movies have male leads. Weber, you're a piece of trash. Everything about you is terrible. Eh, so what? Don't care. <laughs> I don't ever think about those things till afterwards because I don't care. Oh, that'd be awesome if he gets in Cine Taster. Uh, it'd be great. No, I mean, I, I think Payne gets in over Glazer, but I do love I love the choice because because Glazer makes the film, right? The director makes that film. And I think Payne makes the holdovers. So there you go. That's what director should be. We shouldn't be, you know, hey, what we talk about. Every time we talk about like something like director, Sean, what's her ass from CODA? Did she get nominated anywhere? No, because that film's not even well directed. It's just like by the numbers bullshit. That's why she wasn't, you have to at least get that right. Bottoms is terrible. I can't wait to absolutely savage that film next week. I hate that movie. I hate that. I hate poor things. And Bo is afraid. It's Christmas. I can't say hate. Sorry. We're at an hour. Almost done. Go another couple minutes. I'll be out of here. Um, nope. I don't want movie. I will go to the movies. You know what will happen? I don't care if everyone has one of those things strapped on their face. I will make my own screening room where I'll invite some of you to come hang out. We have 50 seats. And if AMC goes out of business and Regal and all these places, I will have a screening room. We'll hang out. It'll serve crap popcorn. It, 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 I'm not even pop. It'll serve. I like peanuts. It'll have you can shell your peanuts, leave them on the floor, and we'll serve Diet Mountain Dew on draft along with Mountain Dew Zero, and then maybe Rockstar if you want it out of the can. And we could possibly have some C4. That's what you get. You come in, you get peanuts. <laughs> C4 <laughs> and protein bars. That's what my theater will serve. <laughs> That's what I have in my life. I'm not even kidding you. Those things are I have in spades. I have a can of C4 like every day. I drink 17 Mountain Dews zeros, and it's just I like that. It's my favorite thing. Uh, I like the lobster, certainly, Melanie, a hell of a lot more than Poor Things. But uh, the favorite is the best of his recent films for me. But Poor Things is fucking, oh, God. Don't, I can't, I can't do it. Um, thank you, Mega Swiper. Appreciate it. You, you guys are awesome. Uh, we'll be back coming up next Sunday. I'm about ready to wrap here. Um, oh, Godzilla minus one, so overrated. I didn't hate it. I didn't, oh, wait, you know what? We'll do biggest show of the year next week. Let's do that with the worst of the year, shill of the year. You guys can, you know, come with your comments when I when this is over. Tell me who your shill of the year would be. I mean, it's really hard. I mean, it's you're 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 talking about. Remember, we had what's his name calling the creator the best movie of the year. What the creator the best movie of the year? My God, I didn't see the killer either. I saw someone who mentioned the killer. Um, I'm not. Come on, Rebel Moon. Whoa. 
I, it, you know, Tucker, honestly, we'll find out. I can tell you this. I think I'm leaning towards Poor Things is the number one worst film. Let me think on that. I've got a week, less than a week. I've got six days to ruminate on the idea of placing Poor Things below Bo is Afraid as we stack the 10 worst films of the year. But the sheer level of anger that I felt after Poor Things man, remember how I got worked up after Bo is Afraid? Boy, that's close. Like, guys, you're ask that's like, you're asking me would I rather be tortured by item A or B? You're being tortured either way. It's very hard. It's a very hard decision. I will try to make that, uh, you know, final, you know, gavel down. This is the worst film of the year next week. Barbie's a bad film. Uh... I don't th- listen. Go back and watch the stream. That's the homework for anyone that you know, like. Why is Barbie not here? Barbie is maddening because you like it, then you hate, then you like it, then you, hate, you. It's all over the place. It's so uneven with with things you like and don't like about it. It's not it, that. No way. No way. Oh, watch out! We could get in trouble if we do that. I can't. No, the thing about what Zoe does. Zoe just says. Zoe just says what's expected. Zoe will never say what's not expected. That's a shill. Like, oh, poor things is unbelievable. Every every art thing is amazing. That's not that's not even talent. It's not even talent. No talent. You got to have talent to do this. And you know what that takes? Guess what you got to do? You got to step up and say, this is bad, even if the director is Yorgos Lanthimos. Even if the director is someone you love, Ari Aster. You got to come out and say, this is terrible. You, look, no, no further than Babylon last year. Who was the guy who walked straight out without any reaction and said, this movie's a flaming disaster? Bang. And look, it was. Babylon. But I didn't need anybody else to tell me that. But everyone else is like, oh, it's Chazelle. Chazelle's a master. You can't say it's terrible. Yes, I can. We don't do that. We don't play that game here. In you guys rock. Merry Christmas. I, I don't want to get all negative because that comes next week. And it's Christmas. We got to have the good spirit. Thanks for being here, guys. Always uh, a pleasure. Well, let's hope that 2024 is stronger than 2023. Although, listen, we picked some good films. I just want to be like, oh, my God, the number one film of the year is. And Holdovers is. But Tar blows holdovers away after sun for me blows holdovers away i mean i like tollers a lot but you see what i'm saying decision to leave boom moon age daydream boom moon age daydream i still think about today um what brett did with that film oh my god love moon age daydream i'm so proud of myself that i went to see that film in imax like four times i love moon age daydream all right guys peace out live from la i'll see you on uh, next sunday uh, because we'll be back on a regular day, a regular night. It is New Year's Eve. I got nothing. I'm not going anywhere. I don't do shit for New Year's Eve. We'll do a stream. I might even do a two-hour stream that night because it's New Year's Eve. Who cares? We'll count down the midnight. You know what we'll do? I will try to aim for the worst film of the year to land exactly at midnight. That means if we start at 830, I've got to slowly work up to that number one film and at midnight when the ball comes crashing down here it is the number one film and then i will just go ballistic on the mic for like 30 minutes about the worst film of the year ranting and raving f-bombs all kind it'll be insanity next sunday as we count down the worst films of 2023 you're so mean eric why are you so mean to these directors they're just trying to make terrible films let them make terrible films no, we're going to call them out for it next Sunday. Merry Christmas, all. I'll see you on Sunday. Peace out.